so you get to this point, you've done most of the of the uh, pulling up, you you know, and shaping it with your fingers, and now you can go to tools. You can't leave it like this. It's, it, some, sometimes it's nice to have some irregularity, um, but I I always like for these rounded bottom things to have like a smoothness so that, that if you do use a spoon or something in them they don't know the chatter. So I go back in with a metal rib and uh, and work with it. You can also use a wooden rib. Um, I I have grew up using a stainless metal rib so this is the same tool that I've used. I make a lot of my tools but uh, there's some things that I haven't been able to duplicate. Well, not having the right material for something that I have used in the past that I can't make as easily. If you have stainless steel available, you can make your own. Um, and the problem is that when I've made them myself, this, and you have to watch out, if you use a grog clay, this could get really sharp if you don't cut yourself on it. And that goes for all tools that are metal as they will actually sharpen and you grind like if you go against the wheel head like that. They get sharp and you have to be careful not to cut yourself. Um, so, so there are some things that that you can get that are manufactured that, I, that work better than what you might have available, you know, as far as uh, tools go that you can buy. Um, or make. Uh, obviously, in the past, potters made all their own tools, and artists as well. Uh, like, say, Michelangelo, probably one of the first things he learned to do was to make chisels because he started out as a, a stonemason. So it's the same thing with almost every art form. Painters in the past mixed their own paints. Uh, they had to find the pigments uh, as they became available through commerce, they were able to buy them. And as we progress in history, you have more and more colors added to palettes. To palette. um, some of this has to do with the fact that we saw differently, but that's another story I'm talking about making chalices. You know, the thing about pottery is you can't escape tradition when you're a potter. You are talking about things that have a history. Um, and in, sen and then in that sense, it's almost every material has a history. So um, even if you're starting out with modern materials, uh, they have a history as well. Because they come from the earth, the earth itself has a history. Um, I think that's where we get into conceptual art. People are trying to, to move more and more towards um, pure, creation out of consciousness, uh, but we're given something, and that's where we start from in terms of our, uh, we're given consciousness, so even consciousness has a history. So all of these things, it shouldn't be dawning, it should be liberating ultimately that you have something to work with. Um, ultimately, we become free beings by the way that we uh, continue to be creative beings with with what we're given, and then to some extent, finally, what we create that is usually ultimately unique. It, every person's creation is unique in some way. Even if you're copying something, you cannot escape the fact that there's going to be something that's unique in the world. Uh, and I don't suggest cop just copying things. So here it's like a traditional goblet shape. And if you look inside of this, you can see that, that I've smoothed it out. I'm not going to move the camera. I'm, I've kind of left some of the throwing marks, but it's pretty smooth on the outside too. And then you can, you can think of this the same way you would if it were on the wheel head. You can go from slightly above the bottom part of it go down just a little bit, kind of make a, a mark there, undercut it. That gives you somewhere to work with. Now, the Japanese who were, who were masters of throwing off the hump, um, Japanese potters of the past, 
um, they would use a silk thread. They would just take a, a little a little stick with a silk thread on the end, and they would grab it in that groove and then pull, and that would cut it off, and they pick it up. Uh, I didn't perfect that technique, so I just cut it like this. And I may have to trim a little, um, but that becomes the foundation for my uh, not the foundation, but the the bowl for my for my goblet. I throw the second part, which is the stem, upside down. And finishing is a lot of the, where the originality in these forms come from. The uniqueness of style is all the ways that you do things, whether it's simplifying or whether it is um, elaborating. So simplification of form, where it goes by that old mantra of form follow, follows function, which has also been rebelled against um, in, in modern and contemporary times, but it also comes out of some of modernism, like the Bauhaus. I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember the origins of that phrase, but it's not original. Form follows function, and I'm not an absolute proponent of that. Um, I think that some functions and some forms are not apparent in the relationship. So uh, everything is paradoxical in this realm, but paradox can be um, can be reconciled. I, I, I have acquired the practice of trying to use a Galian dialectic in order to reconcile paradox. And that is the idea that you have a thesis, antithesis, and a synthesis, or something similar, like you have a something that seems to be opposite, it's like black and white. And you notice the in the Orient they have the yin yang, and black is incorporated in white, and white is incorporated in black, it creates a third form. Now uh, there's a lot of examples of that type of thing. So we're talking about tradition. We're also talking about something that's not static. We're talking about, because tradition in some sense doesn't really exist uh, as a static form. Um, we could say it does, but it's not necessarily the truth. Everything has an origin and everything has an evolution or a progression. Or a devolution is possible as well, where things devolve from, uh, you see that in some art where you have uh, a lot of people that that decry modernism as a as a as a devolution, well, like, like Hitler did. Hitler thought of it as decadent art, uh, modern or most modernism. But the but the truth is is that uh, you can also see it as evolution as well when things change and, and fall apart and become deconstructed. It's only to be, be, be built back up again. That's also a part of it. We have growth and decay, and they are both part of a whole. And you have to see them as part of a whole, and there's beauty in both. So I've been talking, and I haven't been like, paying attention to what I'm doing as much as I should have. So I may have not left myself enough clay to balance out that bottom. So I'll, I'll try and thin this out a little bit and bring it up. Um, the things that you should be concerned about when you're making a goblet is you don't get too, too thin with especially the base. So right here needs to be thicker to support. And you, you want to make sure that that's true as well because if you throw it upside down especially, so what I can do here is I can move this down just a 